to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ for the grace of god that brings salvation has appeared to all men titus chapter 2 and verse 11 Welcome to our study of salvation by grace through faith. How thankful each child of God and each person ought to be for the grace of God that makes salvation available to us. Because of God's love, because of His mercy, He has brought salvation down to mankind. But that salvation, although it is here and available, is only accessible by our faith. That is, I've got to access God's grace by putting my faith in God and doing exactly what He says. And so today we want to study about the beautiful subject of salvation by grace combined with faith. As we think about this, let's realize the words and remember the words of Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. This kind of sets the stage for our study today. Notice Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 8. The Bible says, The Bible says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is by grace. That is God's part. God has made salvation available because He is a gracious and loving God. But it's through faith, meaning God has done His part, made it available. We've got to do our part faith in God, and it's not of works. We can't earn that, for God himself created us for good works, but we must do what God says to be right with him. As we begin our study on salvation by grace through faith, let's first of all realize some false teaching about grace. Grace has been distorted, and grace has been abused. It was never meant to teach and, and go along with some of the things that people believe today. What are some false teachings about grace? First, some believe and act like grace is a license to sin. That is, because we now have the grace of God, some will say, well, it doesn't matter how I act or what I do, I'm going to be saved anyway. This is inferred by people's speech. Sometimes people speak and act like anything they want to say or anything they want to act and they can chalk it up to the grace of God and say, well, everything's going to be okay. I can talk like that and maybe that's not the best language, but hey, we're covered by grace. Well, maybe I shouldn't act that way. Maybe I shouldn't have done that to that person, but you know what? We're both covered by the grace of God. Well, we may be a little more worldly. We may get into a few things that we really ought not to get into, but you know that umbrella of grace is going to cover our sin anyway. Is that really what the scriptures teach? I want you to notice Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. The apostle Paul dealt with this idea when he was writing to the Romans and he said, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? The idea that some were thinking is, well, if, if grace was given to cover sin, more sin, more grace, and so we can just go out and sin, and the more we sin, the more grace God's going to dump on us if we can use that word. And thus, we must be careful not to use grace as a license to sin. Another false teaching about grace is that grace alone saves us. Now, I understand, and the scriptures clearly teach, salvation is brought down to man by the grace of God. Titus 2 verse 11, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. But grace in and of itself is not going to save anybody. Oh, it may make it available. It may make it here and available for us, but just because something's here doesn't mean we've accessed it. Let me illustrate. 
The Bible clearly teaches that a person must do certain things to be right with God. Not that we earn our salvation, but because God has said it, we must do it. For example, in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 21, Jesus clearly taught, it's not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there, listen, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus condemned the Jews and he said to them in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? The Bible teaches in John 14, verse 15, if you love Jesus, you must keep his commandments. The Hebrews writer said in Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9, that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. Yes, Ephesians 2, verse 8 teaches that salvation is by grace, but don't forget the latter part, through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is made possible by God's grace, but it's accessed through my faith. And so it's not grace alone that saves a person. But then there's another false teaching about grace that we need to notice today. And that is some teach that a person can never fall from grace. That is, once I obey the gospel, once I become a Christian, once I've been enveloped by God's grace, there's nothing I can ever do to lose that salvation and I can never get outside the umbrella of God's grace. Well, is that what the scriptures teach? Do the scriptures teach, once saved, always saved, that a person cannot fall from grace? Now, here's what's so interesting about that. The scriptures not only don't teach that idea, the scriptures explicitly condemn that. Think about several examples. In Acts chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer has just obeyed the gospel. In his previous life, he was a magician. You might use that term to represent what Simon did. He was a trickster by the slide of the hand, by movements too quick for the eye. And so he was a magician. He now obeys the gospel, and for the very first time, Simon sees a real bona fide miracle. And so he says, he reverts back to his old life, and he says, I'll give you money if you give me that power. And Peter says this, your money perish, listen now, with you. Your heart is not right. You need neither part nor portion in this matter. You need to repent and pray to God if the evil thought of your heart might be forgiven you. Now, what was going to perish? Your money was going to perish with you. If there is ever a clear-cut case of someone who was a child of God, baptized by an inspired man of God, an apostle, and he fell and was going to be lost, this is it. You can't get much clearer than that. Simon came under the umbrella of grace. He was saved by the grace of God, and he sinned and fell outside that grace. Revelation chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, if Jesus says we don't continue faithful, those inside the church, if they didn't remain faithful, their names would be blotted out of the book of life. Now, wait a minute. Where are the saved at? The saved are in the church. The saved are in the body. Once we've obeyed the gospel, we come under God's grace, but to some in the body who were saved and who were under God's grace, Jesus said, I'm going to blot your name out if you don't remain faithful. And thus, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, we must be more diligent to make our calling and election sure. If I can never lose that election, why would Peter say, make your calling and election sure? Now let's get to the clearest of all. And this uses the exact language that many false teachers use to promote their ideas. I want you to notice Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. Notice what the scripture says in Galatians 5 verse 4. The apostle Paul writing to Christians in the church in Galatia says, You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law, now notice, you have fallen from grace. Not you are thinking about it or not, you might, you already have. And the word there is not just from, but it's the Greek word ek, which means out of. You were in the grace of God, you tried to go back now to the old law, and you are now outside of God's grace. You've been cut off from Christ. How much clearer language do we need?
to understand that a person can fall from the grace of God. And so the old idea that false teachers propagate that one can never be lost once he's saved doesn't stand the scrutiny of honest Bible study. And so there are some false teachings about grace that we need to deal with, but let's ask the question then, how does grace save? How does the grace of God uh, save a person? Well, here's how. It is grace that makes salvation available. It comes down to man and it presents salvation to us by the grace of God. You see, grace originates with God the Father. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so here's God's grace given to us in that he sent his Son as a sacrifice for sin. That's God's part. He sent Jesus. He made the ultimate sacrifice. He makes salvation available. Well, grace also came through Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5, verses 15 through 18, and Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, clearly teaches that, that when Jesus came to this earth, he suffered, he died, he gave his life as a sacrifice for us, that, that grace came through Christ. In fact, it's John chapter 1, verse 17 that says, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth are in Christ. And it is that grace that is revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. Notice Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 clearly teaches, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. Well, how did that grace appear? Right here in the pages of the Bible, and not only in God sending His Son, but the gospel is the message of grace. And thus, when we listen to the words of the Father, when we see the sacrifice of Jesus, when we read the scriptures, we have God's grace given to us, and it's the grace that saves by the great sacrifice that Jesus made. But now let's look at the second part of salvation by grace through faith. It is faith that it makes salvation accessible. That is, I come in contact with the grace of God when I respond in faith. Now what is faith? Hebrews 11 verse 1 says faith is substance and faith is evidence. Faith is not a leap into the dark. Faith is not something better felt than told. Faith is always based on substance and based on evidence that we find not only in the Word of God, but in the world around us. I can look and I can see there is a God. Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. Romans 1, 18 through 20 teaches us that the attributes of God are clearly seen by the things He has made. Look around and you can know God exists. And friend, we've got to realize faith is just as essential to salvation as grace is. No grace, no salvation, no faith, no salvation. Now notice Hebrews 11 verse 6 clearly teaches that faith is man's part. Grace is God's part. He made it available. Faith is my part. Notice the words of Hebrews 11 verse 6. The Hebrew writer says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The person who approaches God has to have faith, belief, obedient trust in God that he will do what he says. Now, the next question is, if faith is how I come in contact, how I access the grace of God, how do I get faith? And that's clearly answered in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I have to hear to have faith. And what is it I have to hear? I have to hear the word of God. That's where I get my faith in God as I read about God, as I study his character, as I see the nature of God, and as I listen to what God says, I put my faith into action. Now, we need to understand faith is always an action word. Faith is never mental acceptance alone. My, faith is not just, okay, I accept the fact. 
No, faith is much more than that. For in Romans chapter 1, verse 5 through 6, and Romans 16, 26, at the open and the close of the book of Romans, it is the obedience of faith. When we talk about faith in Scripture, it's always obedient, active trust in God based on who He is and based on the evidence that we find. Faith must trust God and take Him at His word. The Bible says in Proverbs 3 and verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways and He will direct your path. And faith then must act. If I come to the decision and I come to the mindset, there is a God, this is His Word, and I want to have that grace so I can have salvation, I have to do something. Romans chapter 10 verse 13 teaches us that faith is an action word that we put into obedience. But how do we do that? How do we respond in obedience to God? Well, just as Paul did. Saul was told in Acts chapter 9 verse 6, you go into the city it'll be told you what you must do. Now, the grace of God had appeared in Jesus Christ already, but Saul wasn't saved yet. You go in the city, be told you what you must do. There's still something for Saul to do to access the grace of God. What was it? Ananias comes to Saul in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16 and says, Saul, Saul, why tarryest thou? Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. How did Saul access the grace of God that saves? Saul got up and did what God said. He put his faith into action by obeying the voice of God. Now, are we going to say that Saul earned his salvation because he did that? Not at all. We're not teaching. Please understand, the Bible doesn't teach, nor do we, that you can do so many good acts and that you can say so many words or you can do so many things and, and earn your salvation in the sense that we can look up to heaven and say, God, I've done it, now you owe it to me. Here's what the Bible teaches. And you, when you've done all those things commanded, you say, I'm an unprofitable servant. I've only done that which was my duty to do. Luke chapter 17 and verse 10. Thus, when faith and action are combined together, that's when we'll have a live faith, not a dead faith. James 2 verse 26 describes that, that faith that just says I believe in God and doesn't get out and do anything as a dead, lifeless, useless, salvationless faith that won't get anybody to heaven and won't access the grace of God. Well, for just a minute, let's also notice that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is the epitome of God's grace. Grace never came through Moses. Galatians 3 verse 10 and James chapter 2 verse 10 teaches us that the law brought condemnation. The law did not bring salvation and grace. The law kept check on sin. And the, if you misstepped in one part of the law, you were guilty of it all. But where did grace come into the picture? Notice the beautiful words of John chapter 1 and verse 17. The scripture says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. It was that old law, that law that could never save, that law that the sacrifices of it couldn't take away sin, Hebrews 10, 3 and 4, that law which looked forward to something better, Hebrews 8, verse 6, it couldn't save. But grace and salvation and truth came through Jesus Christ. When we say Jesus is the epitome of grace, we mean that Jesus is the bringer that He is the embodiment of the grace of God. If you want a, a picture of grace, see what Jesus gave up. Let me illustrate. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9 teaches us about the grace of Christ. Look at this beautiful passage. The Bible says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. What do we mean when we say Jesus Christ is the grace of God? Think about this wonderful thought. Jesus was in heaven, the very place we're trying to go. He left heaven, came to this earth, 
lived as a pauper, as a poor man, didn't even have a place to call his own, place to lay his head, and he did all of that so that one day I could live in heaven, be with him and God, and experience the richness of God's grace at its height, at its fullness. That's what we mean by the grace of God. He did not consider it robbery to be made equal with God, but he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And so when we talk about grace, Jesus illustrates that grace to us. But let's also realize the selflessness of our salvation. It's not of works. We're not saying that we can earn or merit our salvation. The way to heaven, it's not in man. Jeremiah 10, 23, Jeremiah said, O Lord, I know the, the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who works or walks to direct his own steps. It's not our righteousness that's going to get us to heaven. Oftentimes we think of, if I obey the gospel and if I'm righteous, then that's how I'll get to heaven. Now don't get me wrong, you've got to be righteous. But your righteousness is not going to get you to heaven. If we get to heaven, it'll be by the grace of God. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, All our righteousness is like filthy rags. Paul said, They have a zeal for God, some in Romans 10, but not according to knowledge. Remember, when we've done all those things commanded us, we say, I'm good and I deserve to go to heaven. Uh-uh. I'm an unprofitable servant. I've only done that which was my duty to do. And so let's not mistake righteousness for grace. Yes, righteousness is necessary. You cannot be right with God without living the way he wants you to, but righteousness won't be the reason I go to heaven. Grace will be the reason I get to go to heaven. To glory, therefore, all goes to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 30 and 31, Paul would say, To him that glories, let him glory in the Lord. If I'm going to boast about something and I'm going to brag about something, I'm not going to look at myself in the mirror and say, Look what you've done and look how right you are. I'm going to say, Thank God that I have the opportunity and the privilege to obey the gospel and to live a righteous life. And I'm going to realize even then, if I make it to heaven, It'll be by the grace of our God. Luke 18 gives us an illustration of that. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other, he was a, a tax collector, a Samaritan. He wasn't even a good man. And so you've got this Pharisee and here's what he says. He stood thus within himself and he prayed, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other men, like this publican or tax collector. I give of all that I have. I tithe. I do all these things. And so he stood within himself and he said, number one, I'm thankful I'm not like everybody else. And number two, God, you ought to be thankful I'm on your side. Look what I do. And then the publican, the tax collector, he wouldn't even so much as approach the temple, but he, he beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He knew he was wrong and knew he was a sinner and he knew he needed the mercy of God. Now, which of the two was right with God? The one who thought he had it all and thought God needed him or the one who knew he was spiritually bankrupt and needed God. Jesus said the tax collector went to his house justified. He realized he couldn't do it on his own merit. He realized that he couldn't earn his way to salvation. He realized he needed God's help to be saved. And so how is it today that a person is going to come in contact with the grace of God how is it if, if I'm not a child of God or maybe if I've had a misunderstanding of grace and I want to know what I need to do to get into the grace of God, what do I need to do? How do I access that? Notice the teaching of Romans chapter 5 and verse 2. The scripture says, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I can only access the grace of God by faith. If you want to receive the grace of God today, you've got to access it by doing what God says. Well, someone says, okay, what does that mean? What do I have to do to be right with God. Salvation and grace are here. Titus 2 verse 11, it's available for all. Whosoever will let him come. Revelation 22 verses 14 following, it's in Jesus, John 1 17, and thus I must obey 
God's commands concerning salvation. Yes, you've got to do what the Bible says. Think about this, Roman. If God says do something and I don't do that, is God going to be happy with me? Am I going to be in God's grace if I don't do what he says? Of course not. Now remember, we're not saying you're going to earn your salvation. It's still by grace, but you've got to access it by faith. Well, here's the five steps God teaches in Scripture for salvation. Number one, to access the grace of God, you have to begin by hearing the Word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I've got to take God's Word as it is, and I've got to do what it says. Then secondly, you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. As Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are traveling down the road, they come to a certain water, and he says, hey, here's water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? Do you remember the hindrance? If you believe with all your heart, you may. Acts chapter 8, verse 34 following. Once I've believed in Jesus, then I must repent of sin in my life. Acts 3 and verse 19, the scripture says, repent and turn again. Repentance is a changed will that leads to a changed way. I say to myself, I can no longer live that way. I've got to accept God's way. And then I prove that by bringing forth fruits worthy of repentance. Luke chapter 3 and verse 6. And then one, one, once one is repented, he must make that good confession. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Romans 10 verse 10, Acts chapter 8 verse 36 and 37. But it doesn't end there. To get into the grace of God, which is in Christ, I must be baptized into Christ. If grace is in Christ and salvation's in Christ, how do I get in Christ? Listen to Galatians 3.27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You can't obey the gospel and access the grace of God until you're baptized. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Friend, are you in the grace of God? Have you accessed God's amazing grace through faith? And are you living the way you ought to? I hope today that your life is what it ought to be and may God help each of us to appreciate and live every day by the amazing grace of our God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.